29 AD, there was one about to change the world. Fully man, fully God, Jesus. Next to him was a friend who witnessed everything. He saw early miracles. He sat at his right hand. His own eyes saw Jesus transfigured. The very heart of Christ was poured out to him, and he was there at the cross on the day history was altered. These are the words and the story of John. You know, my wife had her uh, rotator cuff repaired uh, Thursday, and uh, uh, one of the doctors here at Heart of a Man, Jeff Soldatis. Jeff, are you over there? Where are you, buddy? Raise your hand. See him right there? There he is, guys. If you need a shoulder done, that's your guy right there, man. Woo! He's the top doc, man. So thank you, Jeff. He was awesome. Well, Jeff got her all buttoned up, and he got her out the door. We got home, and we arrived home, and she uh, had this big thing on her shoulder, you know, and all this gauze, and then he pumped all these chemicals in there to put a block in so it wouldn't hurt. And then they sent us home with this machine that, you know, strap on there, this cryo pack, and you pump cold water through, and it keeps the swelling from happening. And my wife was looking at it, and she's looking at the thing, and she couldn't feel the cold, and she's like, it's not working, it's going to swell, it's going to turn into a problem. And, and I'm explaining to her, no, 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 you've got this nerve block and this padding, and the doc knows what he's doing. He put it on there, it'll all, it, it's good, let's just trust him and go with it. And she said, no, I, I don't believe you. I, I don't think you know what you're talking about, and I just, I just don't believe you. And I'm like, yeah, that's normal here. Um, <laughs> So she just said, can we just text the doctor? And she knew I knew Jeff, and so she's taking advantage of this. So she's like, can we, can we just text the doctor and ask him if we should take the, the stuff off and just get that cold right on there? And I said, I, I really don't think we should do that. No, please, you know, can you just text him? So, of course, I send Jeff a text, and he immediately responds and says, just leave it all the way it is, all right? You know, <laughs> I kind of know what I'm doing here, right? So, and he didn't say it that way, but it was clear that, you know, it was like, just no, leave it the way, put it back together. So I'm like, yep, here's what he said. And I show her turn, she got, just calm then. She just calmed right down and she's like, okay, okay, that's good. And just relieved and relaxed, all the anxiety was gone because Doc said, that's what to do. And I realized in that moment, I'm literally sitting there thinking, you know, People do that all the time. They believe, they trust, and they follow a person that has the credentials that they deem as highly credible. Isn't that what you do? You follow people that you think are credible. And my wife looked at me and said, you're not credible. And she looked at Jeff and said, he is. And so I'm going to believe him and trust him and follow him. That's what we do. Well, tonight, you guys, John wrote the first 18 verses of his gospel, which is called the prologue to clearly state the credentials of Jesus. And he did this so that when the people would read this gospel, they would be confident that those credentials would cause them to believe. They could trust what he's saying. They could truly believe he had what it took to be saying and doing the things he did, and they would follow him, they would trust him, and they would get behind him. And so John's prologue is Jesus' credentials for the gospel of John. So let me open us with a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into that. Let us pray, Lord. Father God, we thank you so much for these words, for these powerful words. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for talking to us and speaking to us. Thank you for the hard work all these men did to get ready for this lesson tonight. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that we hear you speak. Lord, change our hearts. Don't let your words land and let us leave here with nothing to do that we can be better at. Lord, help us take our inheritance and use it well, Lord. Father, I would ask that you would uh, help them hear your spirit no matter what I say and how I say it. Don't let me get in the way of you, Lord. So bless this time together, Lord. And selfishly, Father, please help there be no cell signal in here tonight for 20 minutes. In your name I pray, amen. So guys, verses 1 through 18 are called the prologue. Greek plays at that time were written, and they began with a prologue. And it was actually called a prologus, which meant before words. So pro, before, logos, before words. And it was always the introduction to a main story. The Apostle John at that time is living in Ephesus, which is in modern-day Turkey, right across the Adriatic Sea from Greece. So he's very much in close proximity with the Greek culture. John knew that his gospel would be widely read by Greeks, so he used a prologus to introduce them to Jesus, the main character of his story. In his first 18 verses of John, we read what is considered one of the most 
uh, eloquent masterpieces in literature that dis- depicts Jesus. I mean, this is a beautiful piece of work. And if I could read Greek to you and show you the structure and the rhythm and the rhyme to this document, it would really just lift your soul because it was meant to do that. It was meant to affect you by just reading it the way it sounded and the way it was built. It's a beautiful piece of work. And in it is presented a man who had an, by, presented by a man who had an intimate firsthand knowledge of Jesus. Right, John is writing this. He knows this man, and so he's trying to paint this beautiful picture of him. The other three Gospels start with his birth and his genealogy. John starts with Jesus in heaven with God. In Genesis 1.28, God says, let us make man in our image. Moses, who wrote Genesis, was making it clear that God was not alone at the time of creation. In Philippians 2, Paul identifies who was there at that time. Paul says this, who being in in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. Paul and John identify the person with God and his name is Jesus. In verses one through four, Jesus is revealed in the beginning as the word and as the light. And verse 1 is a direct reference to Genesis 1, where they both start with, in the beginning. John is starting without uh, without question. He's stating without question, Jesus existed before time. This is key. He's saying before time, Jesus is with God. And only God existed before time, which means Jesus is God. This is hard for people to fathom. John is also making a strong connection to the writings of Moses, which is Genesis. He is connecting Jesus born from the tribe of Judah to the God of all the Jews. He's saying Jesus preceded Abraham before the tribes of Israel were ever existing. And this is important for the Judean Jews, which this whole book of John is about a conflict between the Judean Jews and Jesus. Pay attention to it. I'll refer to it often. But this is a point he's making to them right now. Jesus was there before Abraham, which means the tribes didn't exist. This is an important statement. John is also declaring Jesus as the Word of God. For Jews, especially Judean Jews, the Word was a direct reference to the law of Moses. And those Jews felt that that law was like a child of God's. He birthed that law just like a child. And Jesus himself is that very law and came to fulfill every word of it. The gospel is written in Greek and is meant to reach Greeks. John describes Jesus in Greek as a logos, logos, the word. Logos is ripe with meaning about Jesus being the purpose of life. The Greeks philosophers talked about this constantly. It was a big part of what they believed in terms of the bigger meta statement about life was this word logos. And on numerous occasions, John will help explain to the the Jewish customs to the Greek reader because they don't understand the Jewish customs. So you clearly get an indication this story is written to talk to Greeks, but it's also written to talk to the Jews and not just the Judean Jews. And Jesus was, in fact, born a Judean Jew. He came to save all Jews, though, and all people. John has numerous references to the Old Testament here, which helps you understand he's trying to reach these Jews as well. This is not just a story to the Greeks. It's very much to the Jews. And many people say he's actually trying to reach the non-Judean Jews in this story. John is testifying as a witness that Jesus is uniquely God that came as a man to live among us. And most people, even us as Christians, strongly struggle with this concept of Jesus as God I remember my father-in-law sitting at a table and we were having a discussion. We didn't have very many spiritual discussions. He was a very bright man, but he didn't want to talk about faith. One day he gave me a little window and I said, Art, what do you think of God? He said, all in. No, there's a God. Get it. Don't have to explain it to me. I'm completely convinced there's a God. I said, okay, so what about Jesus? He said, no go. Don't buy it, not seeing it. He's definitely not God. And we sat and had a discussion about that at length. um, And I pulled out all my best stuff, right? And it didn't work. So I failed. Um, 
But I don't believe I failed. I believe that I did what God called me to do. I stayed in the moment. I shared what I knew. And at least God gave me the opportunity. And I guess when I get to heaven, I'll find out, maybe or not, maybe he won't even let you know the ones you miss, right? Um, but there was that moment that came about, and it made me realize, as a Christian, a lot of people struggle with this concept of Jesus as God. It's a difficult concept. So I'm going to just quickly go through some ammunition for you, because I really do believe we are in a time when you should be sharing uh, and witnessing to unbelievers. I mean, really time when you should be doing that. And you should have some basic ammunition to do that. So here's, a, here's some, a handful of facts to keep in mind. The four Gospels contain very clear testimonies from numerous eyewitnesses. So not just one Gospel, but there's four Gospels, and there's a lot of eyewitnesses in there. And if you just go through those Gospels and highlight the eyewitnesses, that alone would help you show somebody. There's a lot of eyewitnesses in here. Um, and so then their next... A fight is going to be, well, that book's not uh, accurate. And that has really been proven not true. Archaeologists and historians have worked for centuries to prove, in fact, that the Bible is an extremely accurate and historical document that has been passed down at about 99% of its purity from the beginning of when it was first written to now. It is very little deviation. It's probably the most pure document that is in the, in the archives of the world right now. And there's no more uh, manuscripts of any other book in the world than this one that date back as far as the Bible. This document is incredibly accurate and it's historically reliable. Third, Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, wrote about Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection as a historical event and it's recorded. He was a non-believer, but he was a Jewish historian. You know when he wrote? In the first century, in the first 100 years. So he was writing 30 and 40 years after Jesus had died. So it's very, very accurate information. Fourth, the apostles dramatically changed after the resurrection and boldly preached to the death the truth of Jesus. These were men that had dramatically changed because of the resurrection. That is a very uncommon thing to happen. Fifth, hundreds of witnesses saw the resurrected Jesus. Not one, not two, but hundreds of people saw the resurrected Jesus. And there was an empty tomb that has yet to be proven not. There are more followers of Jesus than any other religion in the world, cumulatively since the birth of Jesus. When you go back to his birth, add up all the believers in that time, there's nothing even close in terms of any other religion in terms of number of believers than there is in Christianity. Jesus was the only man who claimed he was God and connected it to hundreds of prophecies were written well before his birth. And then lastly, the most important proof is that every person who truly believes in Jesus will testify to the radical transformation of their heart and mind and attest to the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And they will talk about the transformation and the change in their life and how they have transformed from someone who cared for themselves to having a desire to love and care for others. That is a radical transformation that cannot be explained by anything other than the Holy Spirit. And that comes from our belief in Jesus Christ. So that gives you a handful of key places to have in your hip pocket when you're talking to unbelievers to say, these are the reasons I believe Jesus is God. And I'm telling you guys, that's a strong deck of proof. John is boldly testifying about Jesus, praying his followers will have the same courage and boldness. This is what he's doing. He's praying that you will have the same boldness he has to testify. When was the last time you testified to Jesus about an unbeliever? When was the last time? In Deuteronomy 8, 3 through 4, Moses declares that we get our life from every word of the Lord. Moses reminded Israel God led them, fed them manna every day. And I got to get old after 40 years. My wife eats the same thing every day for breakfast. I don't know how she does it, but these people had to do it too. Without it, they would have died though. Moses went on to say that the law of God, his word, was their new manna. In Matthew 4, 4, when the devil challenges Jesus to turn rocks into bread, Jesus quotes Moses and reinforces that we get our life from every word of God. Jesus is the word. Jesus contains all of life, and Jesus is life. Your source of life, guys, this is the part you want to hear, is not going to come from the words of clever men, scientists, pastors, politicians, athletes, or actors. The Bible is Jesus, the living word of God, and God's word will bring light to men as rational truth. Rational, logical truth changes everything. 
Fear and lies cause anxiety, depression, and anger. And that's what most of us struggle with. One of those two, isn't it? Fear, anxiety, depression, anger, that's all coming from lies that are in your head. God's word brings truth, which defeats fears and lies. We cannot live without the word of God filling our hearts and our minds, you guys. I'm trying to improve my health as I get a little older. I really want to be able to uh, do the work God's given me at, at full strength. I want to be full throttle when I work for God. And I want to be strong to spend time with my sons and their children. And so I've been reading quite a bit about nutrition. And one thing I've learned about nutrition is that the type of calories you consume matter. There's a lot of guys that just talk about calories. Eat these many calories, don't eat these many calories, manage your weight, that's all you got to do. That's not true. The quality of calories is a big deal. In fact, it's been proven pretty clearly, 2,000 calories of a vegetable-based diet is far better for my mind, my body, my health, and my emotional state than 2,000 calories of a sugar-based dessert diet. We all consume information every day, guys, that we feed our minds with. And there's a big difference between the quality of words you consume from the world and the ones you consume from the Word of God. So here's the challenge I have for you. How would you compare the number of calories you consume each day from God's Word compared to those you consume from the world? If you ever, mark, if you ever watch that, just track your words you take in every day. I think you'll be shocked how little of God's Word you take in and how much of the world you take in. It's a very significant difference. In verse 4, John says Jesus is life, and his life is light to men. John connects light and life, both be coming from Jesus. Light brings physical energy. It's electromagnetic radiation that was designed by God for us to see, and it's essential for sustaining life in our bodies. Vitamin D and serotonin, for example, are both made in our body as a result of exposure to sunlight, and both are vital to the health of our physical body and our emotional self. It's really good to see. Light is the purest form of energy and was believed to be the very first form of energy that existed at the beginning of creation. Physicists have long agreed that the Big Bang started with a pulse of light energy. And that's exactly what we read in the book of Genesis when, when God said, let there be light. And it was the first thing that was created. My son Taylor is a photographer and he was explaining lighting to me and how the lighting that you use controls the colors and details of everything you see in a photograph and in a video. And he said he can manipulate and control what you see and don't see in a, in a picture simply by manipulating the quality and the quantity of light. Bad light produces bad images. Good light reveals the fullness of all God has in his mind for us to see. Jesus as our light reveals all that is true, good, and beautiful. And that light is available for every single person, you guys. And think about it. At the end of times, when God brings the new heaven and new earth together, what's the light source? It's Jesus. The sun is gone. And it's the purest form of light we'll ever see. And so when Christopher Rice says, I dream in a million colors I've never seen, that's what he's talking about. Jesus is going to light up a world you've never seen because you're not going to have seen that light color before from the sun because it's just a substitute for Jesus, which is the truest and purest form of light. That's pretty cool. Taylor had that thought. I loved it. Let me tell you a quick story. A Christian missionary told a story of being seasick during a violent storm on a boat, which I've been before. He was in the bottom of the boat vomiting and praying God would help him. And he heard men yelling on deck that a man fell overboard. It was dark, and there was, uh, no one, it was hard to see this guy in the water. The seasick Christian was experiencing severe guilt because he couldn't get out of the basement from throwing up. So he raised a flashlight up near a porthole and let it shine for a couple of minutes just to help. And he had to put it down because he had to vomit some more, and he just couldn't quit vomiting. The man who fell overboard was actually rescued and told the seasick Christian the next day when he had gone under for the third time, he was about to drown. But then he saw a light illuminate his hand when he had just stuck his hand through the water. That light just struck his hand at the right moment. Someone saw it, grabbed his hand, and rescued him and pulled him out of the water. Guys, when we shine light of Jesus into people's lives, people are rescued from every kind of darkness. What is the quality of light you bring to the people around you? 
In verses 10 through 13, John makes it clear Jesus will be rejected by his own and accepted by others. John wrote that Jesus came to the world. He made the world, yet the world did not accept him. The Jewish audience knew John's use of the word world was a direct reference to the tribe of Judah. The Judean Jews, the tribe of David, the lineage of Jesus were the people who rejected Jesus. They controlled the culture, they controlled commerce and all the laws. They rejected Jesus because he denied their authority. Jesus made it clear he received his authority directly from God and he challenged them for hiding behind the law to protect their comfort and their control. Many of us today, a lot of us in this room, have no intention of allowing Jesus to control our life either. We live a very comfortable life with full autonomy and control of every aspect. The Christian culture, guys, is easy to hide behind. We're never challenged, and we can quietly ignore Jesus with very little apparent consequence. How do you hide behind the Christian culture to protect your comfortable lifestyle. In verse 12, John paints the other picture. He talks about an incredible picture of what it's like to receive Jesus as Lord. To those who believe in his name, we become children of God. We're born from the will of God, not the physical desire of a man. We become heirs of God the Father. We can, just like John, humbly proclaim we're loved by Jesus. We inherit everything Jesus owns in creation. He shares it all with us. My friend Jay pointed out that he grew up poor in inner city Detroit. He never dreamed of goals and setting dreams and things like that. It just didn't make sense to him. He, only, he didn't really see it. He couldn't understand. He just thought, hey, I'm just going to grow up another kid on the streets of Detroit. Today, he looks at his life, his wife, his children, his business, his faith. He can't believe it's real. He never dreamed God would give him what he has or use him the way he has right now. And then he reflected this. If he couldn't imagine or envision what he has now, how could he possibly imagine what God has for him in eternity? But here's the hard question. What controls your daily hope? Your ability to picture the future or God's promise of your future? In verses 14 through 18, John completes his prologue by describing Jesus as becoming a man and revealing us his glory, his grace, his truth, and his blessings that are intended for all who believe in him. God chose from the fullness of his love to rescue his creation. He gave us the freedom to choose to love or reject him. And this is at the heart of it. He gave us the freedom to choose to love or reject him. All men carry the desire to love ourself and to reject God. It's hard to believe that's in us, isn't it? Grace means to give something valuable to someone who absolutely does not deserve it. And God expressed grace to all mankind by coming to us as Jesus. His decision to be flogged, crucified, and to die was the fullest expression of his desire to give us what we absolutely do not deserve. We constantly reject God and serve our own selfish needs. We never stop. In no way do we ever deserve to live in heaven with God for all eternity. Yet God sent Jesus, fully knowing the truth of who we are and expressing fully his grace by giving us what we absolutely do not deserve. Let me close with a short story from a missionary that will hopefully capture this idea of grace. While serving with Operation Mobilization in India in 1967, I spent several months in a TB sanitarium with tuberculosis. After being admitted into the sanitarium, I tried to give tracts to the patients, doctors, and nurses, but no one would take them from me. You could tell they didn't like me because I was an American living in a government sanitarium. They didn't know that serving with Operation Mobilization made me just as poor as they were. I was quite discouraged with being sick having everyone angry at me, not being able to witness because of this language barrier, and no one even bothering to take a track of the Gospel of John that was written in their language. The first nights, I would wake up around 2 a.m. coughing. On one morning, as I was going through my coughing spell, I noticed one of the older and certainly sicker patients across the aisle trying to get out of bed. He would sit up on the edge of the bed, and he would try to stand, but because of weakness, would fall back into bed. 
And I really didn't understand what was happening or what he was trying to do. But he finally fell back into his bed, just completely exhausted. And then I heard him gently crying. The next morning, I realized what the man was trying to do. He was simply trying to get up and go to the bathroom. But because of his sicknesses and extreme weakness, he was not able to do it. And being so ill, he simply went to the toilet in his bed. The stench in our ward was awful. And most of the patients yelled insults at the man because of the smell. And the nurses were extremely agitated and angry because they had to clean up this mess. They moved him very roughly from side to side to take care of the problem. And in fact, one of the nurses in her anger slapped him. And the man just rolled up in a ball. He was so embarrassed and he just cried. The next night, again, around 2 a.m., I started coughing. And I looked over and there the man was sitting up, trying to get up, trying to get to the washroom. But he was so weak, he just fell back and he just cried. And I can honestly say, I didn't want to help. But before I realized what was happening, I got up out of my bed and went over to the old man. He was still crying and did not hear me. And as I reached down and touched his shoulder, his eyes opened with fearful look. I simply smiled and put my arm under his head and neck and my other arm under his legs, and I picked him up. I walked down the hall to the washroom, which, guys, was a smelly, filthy, small hole in the wall. It was disgusting. I stood behind him with my arms under his arms, holding him up so he could take care of himself. And after he finished, I picked him up and I carried him back to his bed. And as I began to lay him down with my head next to his, he kissed me on the cheek and smiled and said something I think was like, thank you. It was amazing what happened the next morning. One of the other patients whom I didn't know woke me around 4 a.m. with a steaming cup of delicious Indian tea. He then made motions with his hands because he didn't speak English and asked if he could have one of my tracks. And as the sun came up, some of the other patients began to approach, motioning that they would like one of the booklets as well. And throughout the day, people came to me asking for gospel booklets. This included the nurses, the interns, the doctors. Everybody in the hospital had a booklet of the Gospel of John before that day ended. And over the next few days, several indicated they had trusted Christ as a Savior, resulting from reading the Gospel of John. What did it take to reach these people with the good news of salvation in Jesus? Man, it certainly wasn't my health, and it wasn't my ability to speak or give some moving discourse. And yeah, those health, that good health and that ability to communicate in cultures and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak, that's important. That does happen. But in this case, it simply took one broken man taking another broken man to the bathroom. Anybody could have done that. Dear men, we have that same power inside of us every day. We can give people things they don't deserve that will cost us something to give. God's grace is living in you, and it will flow out of you if you simply make yourself available. How can you be prepared to graciously give of yourself this week? Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we love you. And Lord, you challenge us to be filled with grace, but you have filled us with grace. Lord, make us available. Help us be available so that we can simply help another broken man find his way to the bathroom and find you, Jesus. Lord, help us. Lord, walk with us this week. Help us be better men. Help us be really the kind of guys that you'd be proud of. And Lord, help us honor you with our words and our actions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, guys, have a great week.